Well, <clears throat> perhaps we'll begin because we're at three o'clock. Um, uh, my name is Shauna McCabe and I'm the director of the Art Gallery of Guelph that's uh, hosting this event this afternoon. Um, and I'm really thrilled to welcome you all um, to this uh, conversation. And I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement to start. Um, this statement is, is quite critical for cultural institutions as it recognizes the history and the ongoing impacts of colonialism, as well as the historical complicity of our institutions through their approaches to the representation of difference, um, producing images and narratives that take on an authority in the public sphere. And typically a land acknowledgement uh, recognizes the traditional ownership of the lands upon which an event is held. And I thought because we're all gathered virtually here today, uh, connected and yet physically dispersed across borders, it's a good moment to reflect on the significance of place wherever we are and how the different traditional lands that we reside in and move through inform our lives. We respect the significance of the treaties that continue to affirm the inherent sovereignty of indigenous nations and recognize our responsibility for the stewardship of the lands on which we live, work, and create. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are very pleased to be here today speaking about Monument to the Unelected, a project of Vina Kachadorian with the US election less than 24 hours away. Uh, we are feeling anticipation even here in Canada. And I know um, I was very excited to have this conversation and John said the same thing this morning uh, in, in his email. Um, and, and I know this sentiment is shared around the world. And that was why I was interested in having this conversation today um, uh, at, the very, at the very beginning of this idea and concept. Uh, the ideas and intentions at the heart of the project monument to the unelected are incredibly relevant. Um, to us um, as they all speak, um, as they speak to, as the project speaks to democracy and de democratic process itself. Um, and for those unfamiliar with the uh, project Monument to the Unelected, it was first uh, installed in 2008. And today the evolving installation includes 58 signs that endorse the runner up in every presidential election in US history. Speaking to what might've been really to choices that are not made as Americans prepare to make another monumental political decision. Right now, the installation occupies galleries um, and art museum spaces, as well as community locations across the United States, including a site in Santa Ana, California, presented by John Spiak and Grand Central Art Center. Uh, so I just note um, to everyone who's joined us that uh, everyone has their video off and has been muted for this conversation to avoid any potential noise. And I would ask if you do have questions to use the Q&A uh, section of this webinar and we will um, address them and, and bring those into the conversation a little later. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to introduce both of these individuals to you. Uh, Nina Kachadorian uh, is joining us uh, from Berlin today. Uh, Nina is an interdisciplinary artist whose work includes video, performance, sound, sculpture, photography, and public projects. She's also an associate professor at New York University, and her work is in public and private collections, including the Met, Blanton Museum of Art, Morgan Library, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Margulies Collection, and Saatchi Gallery. How you might also have come across her work, uh, in 2015, her video Accent Elimination was included in the Venice Biennale as part of the Armenian Pavilion, which won the Golden Lion for Best National Participation. Venues for her exhibitions have also included the Serpentine Gallery, Turner Contemporary, Palais de Tokyo, Istanbul uh, Museum of Modern Art, Turku Art Museum, Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, ICA Philadelphia, Brooklyn Museum, Artist Space, Sculpture Center, MoMA, and MoMA PS1. Uh, also, we have with us John Spiak, who's uh, joining us from California today. John is the Director and Chief Curator of California State University Fullerton's Grand Central Art Center in Santa Ana, a position he has held since 2011. His curatorial practice focuses on contemporary art and society, in particular works in socially engaged practices and video. So the, through the Grand Central Art Center's Artist in Residence, Residence Initiative, he hosts national and international artists as they develop projects. Prior to this appointment, he was curator of the Arizona State University Art Museum, 
Uh, and in that role, he was in charge of uh, the residency series, as well as the um, Art Museum Short Film and Video Festival. Um, he has curated over 100 solo exhibitions, solo and group exhibitions, sorry, working with artists including Pipilotti Wrist, uh, Shirin Nishat, Pablo Helguera, Close Commodity, and Paul Ramirez Jonas. His projects have received support from such organizations as the British Council, Metabolic Studio, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. With that, um, I'm so pleased that you could both participate uh, here today. And um, I'd like to um, turn it over to Nina to tell us a bit more about this project. Um, and then we'll move on to John who can speak about its context in California. So over to you, Nina. Thanks, Shauna. Um, thanks, Shauna and John, for, for being for the invitation, for being here, and to all of you who I cannot see, but I trust are out there somewhere. Um, and it's a, yeah, it's a good night to be talking about this piece. It's also an unbelievably nerve-wracking night, generally, um, to be thinking about this topic. So um, I was happy to have this to look forward to, to take my mind off of the fretting a little bit, actually. Um, and I thought it might be useful to precede our sort of discussion that might follow with um, a little bit of storytelling about the history of this piece, because there really are a lot of stories to be told <laughs> at this point. Um, I, I made this piece in 2008. It was a commission by the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art for a 10 year anniversary show that was happening there called Seriously Funny. Um, and the curator who contacted me, Cassandra Koblenz, um, brought me out to, to um, Scottsdale and I did a site visit in 2008 with the goal being to have an idea for a show that was supposed to be about humor. And although I work a lot with humor, I, I very rarely, I never really begin a project thinking I'm going to try to make something funny. It's something that maybe happens um, along the way or as a result of the kinds of things that I'm often attracted to or, um, as a strategy, because I think there are a lot of useful things you can do with humor as a hook and as a kind of um, as a kind of welcome mat to come on in. Um, and as I sometimes like to say, once I have gotten you close, it's possible to sort of close the door behind you and and actually have a conversation with you. So that's one of the ways I like to think about the way that humor can work. Um, when I went to Scottsdale in two thousand eight. It was for that site visit. It was at the time. Uh, it was it was November. Um, no, sorry, earlier than that. It was it was you know the election was imminent, um, but there were signs up like this all over, <laughs> and um, you know the typical kinds of places you see these vacant lots, um, side of the road, people's front lawns, and some of them in Arizona were particularly big. Um, where I grew up in California, I feel like I never saw some that kind of got the scale that some of these did, but it was. An important moment to to visit. Um, interestingly, also because it was John McCain's state, and he was, as I'm sure you remember, one of the presidential um, contenders. So I kept noticing these as I was trying to have an idea, and as I also went around um, looking around Scottsdale, which is a place I'd never been, I I started thinking about um, a lot of the histories of this part of the country and. Um, I'm happy we began with a land acknowledgement because these histories were very much on my mind. And when I saw signs like this sign on that street lamp that said Indian school in reference to these so-called Indian schools, um, there were sort of these constant reminders of, of very bleak, violent histories that sort of hung like a dark, very unfunny cloud on the entire visit for me. And the harder I tried to have a funny idea, the more tragic and awful, everything just seemed to be. And the more awful history, American history, I seemed to see. And so I kept sort of finding that um, the task was getting tough. And, and somewhere in these two things kind of colliding with one another, um, I started to, I guess, um, have an idea. And, um, and the idea came from perhaps observing some of the things about these signs that actually are often kind of funny. And one of the things I love is if you look at that little sign saying parents support parents support Miranda, um, it's the places they're put in these little weed patches to make them stand out. And they, or the sort of graphic design that's involved in these, I feel like there's a very particular kind of design sensibility that comes into these sorts of signs. And um, there's a nice one there in the middle uh, 
Tamara Thomas for Comstable that's very plain. And they, they kind of seem to often indicate a sort of um, proud, confident voice or an independent voice, as Eric Meyer's sign says, or, or something which is sort of um, a bold and assertive statement, but, but where um, you don't want to kind of be too fancy either. The, the sort of high brow um, language of graphic design has no place in these signs. I feel like it's a sort of, it's a sort of language that wants to speak to um, a wide swath and that is important about the way they are designed and the way that they, they want to work. So I came up with this idea that um, would be for this piece, Monument to the Unelected, I decided I would call it. And the idea is that we would take a look at the collective um, US past of all presidential elections by having this set of signs that had the names of everybody from a major party candidate who ran and lost. And in doing so, there would be a way to think about the collective road not taken. It was important to me that the piece in a curious kind of way was politically very nonpartisan, kind of neutral actually. Um, of course, paradoxically, election signs are usually used to put out a strong opinion about something. And in this case, I was really just showing a statement of, of sort of facts along the way to our present moment. Um, so, um, the signs are designed in a contemporary style. I wanted it to have a kind of current day vernacular design feeling. So you could imagine any of these people were running for office now, even for the signs that were very, very recent. I did not use actual election signs from those campaigns. So that's important. All of these were designed from scratch. Um, in Scottsdale, the piece was then put up on three different sites. Um, one of them was the front lawn of a house. And here you are seeing the kind of signage that we used there, which bears resemblance to one of these um, real estate signs when a house is for sale. There was something significant about that in 2008 because Arizona was in the middle of an enormous, worse than in other parts of the country, mortgage crisis, lending crisis. And um, there were a lot of house signs for sale. So I'm going to show you a few views. This is the front of that house. Um, and it really does end up looking like someone is living here who does not know what year it is or <laughs> has some sort of quite curious idea about contemporary politics. Um, one thing that made me happy while we were installing this piece, um, and, and I should mention that the first time around, this piece got installed actually after the election had happened. So. It was already known that McCain Palin, you can see the sign there, had, had lost the election. And somebody came up to me and said, kind of was taking it in and he sort of nodded and he said to me, I know what you're trying to say. You're trying to say that anyone who we could have elected would have been better than the guy we just elected, referring to Obama. And I thought, that's interesting because the piece doesn't take that position. It doesn't take any position, but he read this into the piece. And I've had sort of experiences like this where people take it um, from, from different political viewpoints sort of projecting onto the same thing. And, and it's important to me that the piece maintains that kind of, you know, possibility for that projection. One of the other sites was a vacant lot. So I'm just showing you another one of the Arizona sites. Um, and then the third one, and I apologize for this terrible slide. Uh, my master images for this are on a hard drive in Brooklyn and I'm in Berlin. But the third site has a crazy story attached to it. It was off a freeway um, off ramp and a big road called Price Road on the corner of Price Road and another road, I've forgotten the name of. You would sort of come off the freeway where that black car is and then make a right. And you would sort of pass the signs on a corner as you did that. And if you look just past, um, this is sort of, the, the gravel is where we had installed the signs. If you look just past that, you see a big parking lot. And that was a commuter parking lot for a light rail system that ran from this, lot and you know further into the city. So um, this comes this becomes important later because the crazy thing that happened on this site is that every single sign disappeared. All of them were gone all of a sudden one day. And Cassandra Koblenz, the curator, called me and said, I have something really weird to tell you and I'm trying to get to the bottom of it, but this is what happened. And we scratched our heads. We couldn't figure out, you know, like how all of them could have disappeared at once. And I must say, this was a tough terrain to install into. I remember we had to pound really hard to get the signs into the ground on this really hard packed dirt with gravel on it. The mystery was somewhat solved when we discovered, or she discovered, that there, was, there were CCTV cameras guarding that parking lot. 
And when she got access to that footage, she could see that there was a white city van that had pulled up along these signs and a worker who had gotten out and just very methodically took all the signs and threw them in the van. It turned out that Obama had come to do a visit to Scottsdale Phoenix at that time to address the, the mortgage crisis. And a city worker had been told to please remove the anti-Obama signs at a certain particular intersection because Obama's motorcade was going to sort of pass that location. And the city worker misunderstood my piece to be the anti-Obama signs. And so he went and took them all away, which was kind of hilarious, although slightly tragic. But Cassandra then went and sort of was told, you know, if the signs are still around, they will be at this particular depot. And she went and found this depot where you could see all kinds of other election signs that have been torn out from places, I guess they were placed illegally maybe. And um, was even told which dumpster they would be in. And so in this kind of suspenseful way, I got these pictures from her where she goes and looks inside the dumpster and there was nothing there anymore. So they were all gone. We lost the whole set. But I, I kind of love the story. I love the story in part because of this idea that the president would be so sensitive to us, to an anti sign that, you know, they must be shielded from his, from his eyes. So um, 2012 then rolled around and I showed the piece in, in three different places. One was at uh, an art space in Brooklyn called The Boiler that Pierogi Gallery there has. The other was at the Aldrich Museum in Connecticut outside and the other was at the Wall Street Journal. So I'll quickly show you what these look like. These, this is the Wall Street Journal's headquarters in Washington. And I installed it in these large, large windows that they have facing the street. And what was interesting to me about the site was actually this news ticker because there was a constant stream of present <laughs> coming through this news ticker, um, you know, to the moment news, in contrast to all these things which kind of took you back and back and back and back and back in time. Um, in Connecticut, I installed in front of this colonial era house that was part of the Aldrich Museum's um, exhibition spaces. And there was something quite nice about that. Um, temporal matching because in fact the earliest oldest names on my signs are from roughly around the time of that house. Um, so this had a very sort of bucolic you know um, Connecticut setting and um, yeah and everything went quite smoothly that year <laughs> and then we got to 2016 where um, it was shown again at the Scottsdale Museum of Art in the museum this time. They've made a commitment to show this piece now every four years which is something I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, they're part of the cycle this time around too. And I also showed it at um, a historical house called Leverett's House, um, built in 1793 in Prospect Park, Brooklyn. Um, this was a farm and part of a sort of, um, yeah, a family lived there. And it's a historic house now where you can go and kind of learn about all these kinds of things that historic houses teach you. So I installed on the front lawn. And this time around, the tradition became that I myself came and sort of placed the sign of the most recent losing candidate as soon as we knew the results. So the next day, um, I came out of that door and put the Hillary Clinton sign in the ground as a number of press people watched and documented this event um, in the rain. And that was 2016. And that brings us to the present moment. I wanted to show you this sign because this might be my single favorite real life election sign that I've seen. And I just want to return to this point about um, the kind of particular design sensibility that these signs often have. Um, sometimes just very, very basic. And this is maybe the most basic of them that I've seen. Um, so I, I've been getting the question a lot recently, have you prepared two signs already for this election? And I say, of course I have. You have to be ready with both of them. We certainly learned this in many past elections. You never really know what could happen. Um, so I have the Biden-Harris sign and I have the Trump sign. All of the institutions hosting this have these two signs ready to go. And this time around, um, I have been thrilled and quite overwhelmed also by um, the, the, the good fortune of having eight different places this time want to show this piece. One thing I've really learned through this project is that the mysterious and interesting um, fact, I guess, that, you know, an artwork can mean one thing one year and then sort of take on different meanings as time goes on. I mean, the piece has been the same since it was in 2008, but the world around it obviously changes. And um, 
I guess I take this to mean this year that this election has had so many people thinking about it and it's been so present on people's minds and full of so much tension that this piece has sort of somehow gained a kind of traction that I don't think it's ever had. Um, so um, I will show you what it looks like now on all the different sites that are showing it. It's, um, it's at Pace Gallery in New York shown at a very, in a very sort of, you know, on a big white wall gallery, gallery kind of space. Um, it is in Scottsdale, once again, in front of a private home. It's a very kind person who has allowed us to use their homes. This is always the case. I'm deeply grateful for these people. <laughs> Sean can maybe address this a little bit too when he talks. Um, and here you can see we got the uh, old, old signpost out of storage. It was still there from 2008 and we're using it again um, to mark what the piece is. I, I make a point of never ever having my name on the sign. I don't want people to be sort of immediately identifying this as an artwork and um, it just has the title of the piece and then either a phone number or a QR code or some way you have of getting more information. Here it is in Madison, Wisconsin in front of the home of a former um, now retired um, judge, Judge Abrahamson, who served four, she was elected four times um, to, to the Wisconsin, um, uh, I'm losing my words, uh, the highest level, Supreme Court of <laughs> Wisconsin. Um, and um, apparently I've been told this spot in the neighborhood is a place where election signs often appear because it's a little bit sort of between properties and um, it's, it's open and not usually kind of heavily landscaped. And so people like to put election signs here. So they're sort of in a way in a very natural place this time around. Um, this is the piece at Catherine Clark Gallery in San Francisco where it, it's across two walls. And yesterday the, the show that uh, just opened there um, has this piece in it. It's a picture from the opening. This is in Oakland, downtown Oakland, California, in front of the Roots Community Health Center. Um, and this reaches a really different audience in a different neighborhood than the gallery in San Francisco, not so far away. So I've been really happy to get to kind of, you know, also bring this piece into communities that um, haven't hosted this artwork before. Uh, here we are in Cleveland, in front of the Cleveland Museum of Contemporary Art, where it's kind of put into three different, um, or sorry, Museum of Contemporary Art Cleveland is how I should correctly name that institution. It's in three sort of um, plots of uh, landscaping in front. And um, <laughs> they sent me these pictures the other day. I really like this guy. who's kind of like, hmm, what was going on? Um, I love that picture. And then it is also in front of a, an art space there called Transformer Station. And I would ask you to look very carefully at the front row for a moment. Because when I received this picture, I sort of, I had to sort of stop and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why is the Trump sign already there? Wait a minute, what's going on? And then I realized it's not my Trump sign. It is the Trump campaign sign that someone had apparently put there. And what remains mysterious was whether they put it in the spirit of a Trump supporter adding a political sign to the lawn, or if they put it in the spirit of someone who wanted Trump to lose. And it's, I, I will never know the answer to this, but um, it's the first time a sign, a real sign has been sort of added guerrilla style to the piece. And I wondered if that would happen this time around and it has now. And that brings us to um, Grand Central Arts Center um, and the installation which they are hosting and chaperoning in um, Santa Ana. And here we have a very California setting with palm trees and a nice front lawn and bright sunshine and warm weather. And um, it looks completely fantastic in front of this house. <laughs> and this may be a good time to hand it over to John. Uh, I will just mention very briefly um, that the, the event that we are all wildly and scramblingly planning around now is the placement of the newest losing candidate sign, which of course this time around is very challenging to know how to schedule. Um, we have eight venues, we are in four different time zones, and I've also decided that I wanted to have a first time voter be the person to place the sign because I'm on the wrong side of the ocean. And I think it's a good chance to actually start to kind of distribute the talking about the piece to more voices than mine. So um, I'm really, really happy that everybody is enthusiastic about doing this. And um, we are going to plan on having this event happen on the first Saturday after we have a firm election result. 
If you're interested in watching it, it will be publicly broadcast on Zoom. Pace Gallery will have all the information on their home, you know, on their on their gallery website. And um, you can sign up and watch it happen, no matter what happens. So, John, I think I'm going to go back to this slide and, and let you speak about Santa Ana. Thanks, Nina. Uh, so Nina approached us last fall and said the election's coming up. Um, you know the piece because I should, in full disclosure, Cassandra Koblenz is my lovely partner. And so I was fortunate in 2008 to watch that piece unfold, uh, to see it realized, um, to see the panic when they were all gone that one day. Uh, and to see them rediscovered and reinstalled um, with such success. Uh, and Cassandra had noted in the comments too that it was installed before the election, just prior to the election and um, in Scottsdale the first time and transitioned over. So Thanks, Cassandra. the history continues I, here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so when Nina approached us, uh, we started thinking about best neighborhoods and we were trying to think of a neighborhood that is kind of a transition neighborhood. It's not a very liberal neighborhood. It's not a very conservative neighborhood. Uh, it's a neighborhood that you know, both sides are kind of transitioning through all the time uh, and a high traffic zone. So we have this amazing funder, uh, supporters of Grand Central Art Center, uh, Deb and John Webb, who, Surprisingly, every Halloween, they do this crazy Halloween party where they transition their entire home into a thematic. So I think the last year it was like Dismaland and they had created a fake front dystopian Disneyland in their entire front of their home. And then as you went into the home, it was all transition spaces. So with this year being COVID, um, no Halloween party was going to take place. And so I approached John and said, hey, would you be willing to do this piece? And I mean, it was five minutes later and John was like, let's do it, let's do it. So generously, we installed uh, Tracy Gayer, Grand Central's associate director and I went out and uh, pounded in these rods and zip tied these signs to, to their posts uh, with Nina's guidance and direction that John Adams be front and center to kind of in the middle of the installation overlooking everyone so his sign is there uh, and it as we were installing people were stopping by constantly and asking questions and having conversations and reflecting on people they had voted for or people they had not voted for and um, kind of finding the humor in some of the signs or the intensity in some of the signs so uh, it was Kind of a nice way without having to have a reception for a piece to have a reception uh, over a two-day installation where probably I would say 125 to 130 people stopped by just as we were installing the piece uh, and since that point the press has come by and other people keep stopping by and posting pictures online and sharing images with us and stories with us so uh, I don't know what else to share at this point but I, I would love to hear what Sean is thinking and what questions she might have, so, or the audience as well. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I, 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 just the other night, a friend and I were are rewatching uh, the newsroom, Aaron Sorkin's um, series, and there's this wonderful line about um, every two years we drive to a fire station and overthrow the government and there isn't a policeman in the street. And um, I was, you know, Nina, you talked about how um, the context and kind of the, the kind of the, I guess, the world around this installation changes. And this year, it seems like, you know, the project takes even more, uh, takes on even more poignancy as it highlights, you know, this peaceful transfer of power that, that has happened since the beginning, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that this year uh, seems to be, you know, potentially at risk as a result of Trump's unwillingness to commit to accepting a loss at the polls. And I'm just wondering if you, you know, if you both have thought of this uh, in relationship to the installation. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I've definitely thought about it. And I mean, it's, it's sort of come up in just this incredibly concrete way around, like I said, the planning of the sign placement event. And there have been, a, there's been a lot of conversation around, um, 
how, I mean, you know, the, playing this game of like, when should we make the date and sort of reading and trying to research and it spins you into this kind of strange loop of, of trying to kind of predict the news, which is what so many people I think are just trying to do generally anyway. Um, so yeah, first time this question comes up, as you say, Shauna, and I, I don't know, I've had a few moments where I've thought we may be placing that sign like six Saturdays from now, who knows? I certainly hope that's not the case, but um, I don't know. It, it's, I guess I, I don't have anything profound to say here. <laughs> it's very much been on my mind. Yeah. The thing I've struggled with this time around, I will say, is that it has been really important for this piece to be, as I was saying, sort of nonpartisan in some sense. And, um, and there has been a way in which I think at least four years ago when I placed the sign in the ground, I tried to be quite kind of neutral and factual in my, in my carriage and in temperament as I did that. And um, it's difficult for me this year to try to keep my own political opinions out of this piece. It's really hard. And I'm, I've sort of tried to do that when I speak about it um, in a press context because I want, I feel really strongly about that being important because I don't want people to sort of um, shut out their engagement with the piece because they perceive it to have a political slant or because the artist does. And so, you know, I did an interview, um, well, I won't even say what station I did it with, but there have been a few <laughs> journalists who have tried to bait me a little bit by saying, what sign do you think is gonna be added? And I, I just, you know, I, I won't answer that question. And I reiterate that the piece isn't really about my views on, on this um, question, but, but I do think about the moment where the sign will get placed this year and um, how it will be, you know, on one hand, perhaps difficult to suppress my relief and happiness. And on the other hand, perhaps difficult to suppress my um, despair. If Trump wins, I'll just say forthrightly in this context, I think I can say that. So I don't know. Um, I'd be curious, John, when you've been speaking with people, if you, how you deal with that, if people sort of have asked you <laughs> to come forward with your own personal opinion, or um, if you've ever been put on the spot. At this point, I haven't been put on the spot in terms of, of that issue with a patron. Yeah. But in my own mind, I've really been thinking out, you know, we're going to have a, a first time voter install that sign and we're going yeah. to make it a public event. Yeah. And if there are some people that aren't happy about that, how do we ensure that person's safety and how do we prepare for that? So we, I, we've really been thinking about that and how yeah. we make sure that that person's safe and they don't become uh, you know, a key figure in that process. Um, they don't become villainized or, uh, you know, it's, there's amazing people in these signs that have lost um, and it's the history of the United States, it's fact. So yeah, this year, I think it feels a lot different. It, it, you know, I haven't been involved with it in the pacing in the past, but this year it does feel like there's an intensity. And when you see some of the stuff that's happened over the last few days, you know there's an intensity of of campaigning and um, and strategies that I've never seen before in my life. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I suppose I'm even open to the idea that we we uh you know we rethink doing it publicly. Like, I don't know. I, I, I really feel like there's sort of a, a need right now to be open to any possibility, including doing the whole thing differently than it's been done, which may mean not doing it. I don't know. It's there, there so is, hard to predict. There is actually, I mean, you know, back to what you were saying, you know, there is almost an inherent balance to the project. So, you know, it doesn't, it, 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 it reflects that history, right? So, I think um, it's it's interesting that we're looking at to now, right now, and, and today, um, and even that balance becomes more vivid in a situation with extreme in, in, imbalance, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, wonder too if you could um, talk about you know you talked about sort of the the sign um, design, and and I know that that's quite a conscious uh, you know planning process for you. Um, and there's this humorous dimension that, you know, signs not only for contemporary politicians, but um, we've got, you know, those incorporating names from the 18th century who obviously <laughs> wouldn't have had a, right. a sign with modern type pieces <laughs> and, and yeah. designs. 
Um, but I think it also really points to how media has changed because at some point these signs would have been, you know, kind of an informal poll, right? They would have probably mm -hmm. given a sense of how communities were leaning on. Mm -hmm. And um, just, you know, just given, um, you know, right now we're just, we're so bombarded by visual data and other information about polls and, and, and how people are voting. I'm just wondering, can you talk about um, the project in that format in terms of, you know, just the sort of visual culture history? Sure. Um, I mean, I will say that I've been looking at a lot of, a friend of mine who's in Texas has been posting a lot of um, images of her neighborhood as she walks around and a lot of people have signs in their lawns. And I, I still think in many parts of the country, it seems to work like that kind of poll that you were talking about where people, you know, you kind of know what the neighborhood is voting by what you see on the lawns. And um, yeah, so I've, yeah, I, I think that part of it is still intact. Um, it's strange in New York, it's, it's, you know, lawns are scarce. So <laughs> these aren't, these things aren't sort of signaled in the same places. I feel like you see signs put in people's windows or they're kind of um, maybe, yeah, there's this kind of promoting of a candidate shows up with different forms. But, um, but I, I, Shauna, can you ask me again, the kind of the question, the design related question? I'm not sure I... I... Um, well, I know that you talked a bit about how you, um... You know they're not based on real signs, but do you want to like, just? I know you were doing research with a designer and just look at right, them. right. So they, I should say, they are based on real signs in the sense that we based almost every single sign on a sign that a candidate somewhere actually used at some point. So we have been cribbing from real signs. Um, that we find online or see out in the world to make all of these, but these aren't the candidates' actual real campaign signs. Right. So um, yeah, so that I mean, you know, the one I showed you for this go around, the, the Trump, um, the Trump and then Biden Harris one. Somebody pointed out in a recent talk that I gave about the piece that the Trump sign is blue, which doesn't make sense for a candidate from the Republican Party. And I said that's exactly why I made it blue because there needs to somewhere be a hint that this isn't actually kind of the, but then, you know, that, that sort of fell apart when I saw that one that was added to the lawn in, um, in um, Cleveland, which was blue. So I, you know, I, whoops, I guess that, that logic didn't hold, but, um, but yeah, I, I, we've sort of, and when I say we, I should mention the fantastic designer that I worked with, Evan Gaffney, who, you know, working very closely with him, we sort of designed this original set of 58 signs. And then since 2008, I've been designing the additional ones myself. But um, yeah, looking at ones that seem to have that sort of, you know it when you see it quality of an election sign. Um, some of them, it was particularly sort of fun to sometimes pick some slogans that were not the campaign slogans, but associated with that candidate. So sometimes there were sort of like, D Michael Dukakis was known as the Massachusetts miracle. And we decided to kind of put that on his sign, even though that wasn't his campaign slogan. Um, so, you know, there is some, there's some realness into, in some of these signs as well in that sense. Um, we have a question from Terry Williams. Um, he says, bumper stickers are another classic manifestation of election signage in the US. Have you considered a roadshow version? <laughs> <laughs> I love that idea. Yeah, like, yeah, that would be really nice. You could, you could, someone this year as a gift sent me, um, um, she had found in a thrift store somewhere, these perfect, like unmarred, absolutely perfect, like they had never been taken out of the box perfect. Nixon bumper stickers and she sent me two as a gift and um it was just such a funny object to kind of have I um yeah yeah so yeah bumper stickers maybe maybe next um and John um I'm just wondering you know I know you're you're very interested in social practice and, and that's your sort of primary focus of your territorial um uh, practice but I'm just wondering if you, you know how I think um, Grand Central Art Center is obviously interested in kind of civic discourse. And so how do you, you know, how do you see the installation in relationship to the community and, and kind of the conversations going on and, and, and the center's role in that? Well, I think at this time when we can't be open, um, 
you know, how we could do a project that the community could engage with still uh, on their terms uh, in a safe way. And, you know, it is an election year. It is time to think about histories and histories that are um, these kind of strange histories. I was just thinking about our conversation earlier about these uh, peaceful transitions of powers. And then I think about the Aaron Burr, you know, it's, it seemed more civil when you could just call somebody out to a duel and you know <laughs> shoot it out. Um, it seems kind of ironic that, you know, we're at this point where it's, where we think it's, you know, so traumatic or, but I guess it was just as traumatic back then. People would just did it in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, I mean, this is an opportunity for public to come and to engage and to think about, you know, our histories. And I think that's what we do at Grand Central. We think about relevant issues of our time. Um, we think like, you know, we have two exhibitions up right now, one dealing with uh, kind of community and marketplace in terms of uh, Latino Hispanic communities. And then we have another one um, that, that's by Alfadir Luna, who's an artist from Mexico City. And so we have those as storefront exhibitions. And then we have William Camargo, who's thinking about the local histories of Santa Ana uh, from you know, hangings that occurred back in the, the turn of the century, the first turn of the century, um, right down the block from Grand Central to our current police uh, rating of eighth most violent police force in the United States. Um, you know, they're current histories and, and they're fact. And I think that's what we try to do. We try to, to have exhibitions that are rooted in fact that bring up conversations that are relevant today and try to create relationships and connections. And I think that's the most important thing a lot of our institutions can do, especially where we're located and uh, mm. you know, these times that we're living in. There was also a question in the chat. I just wanted to get to it because I have, because of my wife and I know the answer. Uh, it says, was the original title seriously funny? Um, was the original title seriously funny? And now it's Monument to the Unelected, if yes, oh. reasons for the title oh. change. And I think I, you can address that, Nina, if you would like. Oh, sorry. No, I, it, I, I wasn't clear when I said that. Um, the exhibition that I was invited to be in was called Seriously Funny. And the piece I made for the exhibition, Seriously Funny, was Monument to the Unelected. So two different things. I keep, I, all, day, all, day I've, all day I've been concerned I was going to say Monument to the Unexpected. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's a perfect Freudian slip for today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I like this idea of history too, because um, you know one of the things we 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 you know the history that we see in in kind of visual culture and media today is so much recent history, right? And and I imagine you know the the even the list of presidents historically in the United States would not be you know common knowledge for most people, let alone let alone the runner ups runner runners up, I guess. And so, you know, for you, Nina, maybe for you as well, John, do you see this in terms of education as well? Is there an educational component? Sure. And there is certainly a big fat history quiz here for anybody who arrives at this piece. And, you know, now I have to tell the, the shameful story of something that I found out just a few weeks ago. I don't even know if I've told you this yet, John, but, but what is so interesting through the years of this for me have been the sort of very, very um, well-informed history buff types who sometimes end up seeing this and have not just once but twice now corrected an error in the work. <laughs> and I feel really like it really irks me because I, I checked and checked and checked my facts on the list before I had the sign made. I consulted with two Ivy League history professors to get them to look over my, you know, historical research to make sure all these names were correct. Um, and yet still somehow, even 12 years after making the piece, this year, someone caught a typo. <laughs> and the typo is in that triangular sign that says Adams Bush the one, John, that you stuck right under the palm tree in the image that we're looking at now. Um, and it's got this big glaring face of, of Adams on it. And this guy wrote to me and said, um, he said it so politely too, so nicely. He was like, I, I wondered if on the Adams Bush sign, you were making a sort of oblique reference to the later Bush, you know, father and son who became president. Because the person who was his running mate, Adams, was actually Richard Rush, not Bush. 
And I thought, I cannot believe I have another error in another sign. So it was too late to do anything about it this time around, but 2024, I have a correction to make and a new sign to print because that has to be corrected. And um, I decided this year to just, or once I found this out, to just kind of take the view of, it sort of proves how, how easily the facts of the past slide away from us. Because as I said, it took 12 years for one person to, to bother at least pointing this out to me. And it slipped by a lot of people. So yeah. On that note as well, I think the owner of the Sum John Webb constantly tells me how much he likes the way you informally personalize Tom Jefferson. You know, but it's not Thomas Jefferson, it's not that formal, but it's like, it's, it's, it's Tom, you know, the good old Tom. Um, yeah. And I have to say, I love the, the Herbert Hoover because it's the sign on, below the Herbert Hoover says prohibition and optimism. And then it's got this picture of him that just yeah, says Yeah, we neither. kind of, we kind of made just, up. <laughs> I have sign. to see if I can, I have to see if I can bring you to an image of Her Herbert Hoover from one of the past. Uh, yeah, we, that's another one where we kind of made up. Uh, he's there in the lower right-hand corner. You can just see it. Um, he's looking very serious. But this, this slogan, prohibition optimism, we, we, we kind of made that up. So, I mean, th those were platforms he ran on in a way. But, yeah. It's a good question here. Um, it, it touches on something we mentioned a little while ago, Nina. Um, how has the meaning of this piece changed in the current context, which is critical of the monument during Black Lives Matters and Indigenous First Nations movements? I've especially, I'm especially uh, interested about this in terms of its temporary nature, its malleability, and the non-durability of the material. Yeah, that's a great question and all really great observations. And I think that um, through different works, and if there's time, maybe I'll... I'll perhaps breeze you through another one where I've tried to sort of think through the monument and how that might work. But I mean, when we think, if you sort of gave someone a pop quiz and said monument, what comes to mind? You know, I, I would wager a guess, a bet that many people would say, you know, an old dead guy made of bronze standing on a pedestal. Like there's a sort of permanency to the thing. There's a kind of, um, you know, a validation of certain histories, power structures, all of these things. The reason why a lot of these things are being torn down right now and were criticized or thought through again in a different way. And, and so, yes, I think it is meaningful to me to make something, to call it a monument and to make something that is really flimsy and which in some ways tries to sort of say that um, there's also a lot of history that, that we, for better or worse, and you really could feel that way about any of these signs, you could feel that it's for better or worse that we forget about this person. But that, um, that there's a lot that kind of, um, that kind of um, disappears. And some of it, we probably, you could say also, I would argue some of the histories we don't remember about some of these people, we should probably be remembering more or thinking more about or remembering more. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I agree with everything the question asker points out about this. And, and certainly, in, certainly through a lot of the recent Black Lives Matter um, you know, actions and, and the movement, it's, it's, um, there has been so much interesting attention on monuments and, and what to do about them and, and a kind of refusal to, to keep living with them when they stand for things that are really objectionable. Um, if there's a moment, I'll jump to this other, should I do that? Yeah. Okay. Can, All right. Can I just state one thing though? Uh, the last part of that says, and the non-durability of this material. Man, Nina has some requirements for these signs. They're on super thick corrugated plastic <laughs> and they're all installed on heavy duty rebar. So they are pretty darn durable and uh, it's kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will say that like, it pained me a little bit this year to produce eight sets of 56 signs made of more plastic put in the world. So I'm hoping not too many disappear so I can reuse these in the future. It feels like it's sort of nice if these sets have, have sort of a long, a long life. So um, yeah, I thought it would be interesting to mention this though, because um, we're also having a conversation sort of between many places, but Canada and the US um, among them. So I, I had this commission in 2013, which was this um, commission for the US government. They have a program called um, 
percent for art where, you know, when the government builds a new building, they commission a certain amount of their budget is, is allocated for, to art for that building or for that site. And um, usually when these commissions happen, it's a process of, um, you know, you submit a proposal and they pick one and you end up making the piece that they picked that you've proposed. In this instance though, they sort of approached me and said, we'd like to work with you. Would you be interested in making something for the site? And I didn't, we didn't have an idea on the table. And I, I, I said, um, I would be interested. I, I am really interested in, in many ways, broadly defined sort of border situations. And this, this site was a border, a border crossing station between um, a very small town in northern, northern, northern Maine called Van Buren. And then on the other side of the river that divided the two towns from one another, the town, town of St. Leonard in New Brunswick. Um, and I went up there, I saw the site um, and I started thinking again, it's kind of, you know, gotta have an idea where, let's see, I think I have this marked on the map up there. Yeah, that is where, um, that's how, you know, pretty remote place. And um, the border station was being rebuilt because the river had risen one year and washed away part of it in a flood. So <laughs> they, skipping ahead in the story, replaced it with an absolutely enormous facility, which um, I have yet to see in person because I haven't made it up there yet. Um, I started thinking a lot about what happens when you cross a border and these moments where a place, the new place you've arrived in, tries to kind of quickly define itself for you. So there's a sort of welcome moment, welcome to Maine, welcome to wherever, but then also these sort of symbols that begin to appear or sort of mascots or um, lots of things that, that are trying to kind of um, introduce you quickly and efficiently to the new place where you are. And um, so that kind of thing, I have a real fondness for awkward public sculpture, I will also say. And so I love things like that crazy star, which is sort of sinking into the ground, although maybe it's supposed to be rising out of the ground. Um, so I just began to collect images like this where there were sort of these welcome, welcome to estate moments, but also started thinking about roadside attractions and um, how often those take animal forms. Um, I love things like this too. I'm always, when I'm on some road trip, really excited when I encounter one of these kinds of things. And um, yeah, so, you know, <laughs> they, they ran the gamut and I made a really big collection of sort of a image scrapbook of, of lots of these. And this one, um, I can't quite read now anymore on the slide, but this squid was made somewhere for somewhere in Canada. And that's the artist with the rendering that then became the sculpture. I love this thing. Um, so I, I thought and I thought and I thought, you know, what could I do at this border crossing moment? And there's also a sort of tension that exists with these commissions sometimes because the people working in the building um, sometimes, frankly, I think would rather have this money allocated for the artwork go to something else. So you're not necessarily as, as an artist um, working on one of these sites, the, the thing you are working on is not necessarily always really that welcome. And, and I felt very strongly, I didn't want to make something which would sort of be in that spirit of, you know, I'm from somewhere else. I don't know a thing about this place. I'm going to pop in and impose my artwork on you and then kind of leave. Um, so it was also important to me to make something that had to do with, with the place, but also that I thought people in the place would like. <laughs> and not just the people working at this border station, but the town that was sort of there, um, Van Buren, that they might like. So I began to research state emblems and discovered that every, every U.S. state has this crazy long list of sort of like over-determinedly long <laughs> list of things that are state emblems. And in the case of Maine, it wasn't just the moose, which is the state mammal, but it, the list went on and on. And it was things like the state soft drink and the state dessert and the state treat, which was different from the dessert. And, and the state dirt, there was even a state dirt. There was a state ar Arctic exploration vessel. And of course the state flower, the state tree, the state you know bird and, and all these things. And so what the piece became in the end, because I was also, of course, um, um, bound to producing something that would last for 80 years outdoors in Northern Maine, kind of challenging weather conditions. And I thought, well, it really should be bronze for that reason, but it really should also be bronze because monuments are bronze. And I'm gonna make a monument, like this is gonna be some kind of a monument. And what it became was a sculpture, this is just a digital rendering of all of these symbols incorporated into one place. 
So this is all of Maine's symbols in a sculpture. It's a life-size moose with all of the different things kind of piled on. It, all of these things find a space somewhere. So you've got a coon cat on the back, you've got chickadees on all the antlers, the state bird, um, the leaping landlocked salmon, which is the state fish, and so on and so on and so on. This is what it looked like right after it got installed. Um, the landscaping has not grown in yet. So now it's sort of standing in taller grass and looking a little bit more like a moose might be standing there. Um, the thing that um, made me really happy about this, finally it took four years to get to the point where all of us were ready to move ahead with an idea that I'd propose, is that the town really likes it. And apparently they've nicknamed it um, Marty the Moose for Martin Van Buren, also one of the people on one of my signs. And um, so it's kind of had this, you know, it has become kind of a roadside attraction. And it is also kind of a, you know, bronze proper monument. And um, it sort of looks, this is the sort of point where you, you leave the border um, stationary and enter the town. So it's kind of right there, right there on that border as well. So that's the story. I thought it would be interesting to, to share with you tonight. Um, yeah. Well, they're both very much counter monuments in some way. You know, yeah. They're a bit of critique within them. Yeah, or just maybe I'm trying to make the case that like there are a lot of things worth commemorating. And I think some of those things don't have to be famous dead people at all. Like they don't even need to be people. So um, yeah. I wonder too is, um, you know, we're talking about this generations and, and a, a genealogy of graceful losers, basically, when you look at this installation. And mm -hmm. um, our most recent in instance when there's been sort of significant consideration of, of a missed opportunity was probably with Hillary Clinton um, most recently. But I wonder if doing your research, if any other situations had um, kind of struck you and really caused you to speculate what might have been, right? In, in, in another election. I think one has to think about Gore, you know, that year. That was such a, another one of those very dis, sort of disorienting what is going on moments, um, Gore Bush. So that's pretty recent too. Um, but you know, I haven't done, I have not done a deep dive on every one of these people. I'm the first to admit that, you know, for me too, like some of these names remain unexplored histories for me. So. I mean, it's been sort of like in this nice way, as I sort of described earlier, a piece where I have been sort of sometimes educated through it by other people who know much more than me about some of these people. Um, and that's been a real pleasure. Um, question from Lexa Walsh. Um, oh, hey, how, Lexa. Thanks for tuning in. How is being in Berlin this year affecting your election anxiety? Mm, very interesting question. Um, it feels... On one hand, I mean, uh, you know, I've had a lot of exchanges with friends the last week saying, you just can't imagine how tense it is here. It's so intense in the US right now. And um, I don't feel that in a sort of, I walk out the door and see it way. But on the other hand, it feels a little bit to me like I've been watching the country where I come from the way I would watch a house on fire with all my friends stuck inside it. It's been really hard the last, um, seven, eight months to kind of just constantly be worrying about are people okay for so many reasons. There's so many ways one could not be okay right now. So um, yeah, it's complicated. It feels strange to be far away at this moment. It feels in some ways it has felt kind of bad not to be able to participate in some of what's been going on there politically in ways that I would have done if I'd been in the US. I've been trying to do some of those kinds of things here. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with you all, although I'm over here um, and I voted, <laughs> I voted, so. Can I go back to that last question too? Because I think those ideas of disappointment or uh, mm -hmm. surprise, I think of the Truman Dewey, you know, there's that mm -hmm. famous where De Truman's holding up the newspaper that says Dewey wins, mm -hmm. you know? So I think it's, it's not just these recent, but yeah. It's probably been going on for a long time where there's these upsets and surprises. Mm -hmm. um, but probably more rapidly dispersed information because we have these anticipations because of polars. We have these, mm -hmm. there's just a more of an intensity to it now because we do have these expectations that are even driven more because of the rapid sharing of information that the internet provides. 
Well, we're at an hour mark. So um, if anyone has any final thoughts, Nina or John? Just hang in there, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's my final thought. And I, it would be really lovely um, if any of you are interested in, in um, attending our sign placing event, whatever that is going to look like, whatever that will be and whenever that will be. But just want to invite everybody again. And, and just to reiterate that the info about it will be on um, Pace Gallery's website. And all eight institutions are, we're all doing this together, which has been a really, really nice part of it. Um, I have to say, it's, it's made me feel really good um, to be collaborating in this really huge scale way right now on this. It, it has been a sort of good bolstering feeling against all of the bad feelings. <laughs> so, so yeah, thanks, John, among many of you who might also be from the other institutions listening. Yeah, thank you, Nina, for the opportunity. And thank you, Shauna, for the opportunity to, to have a conversation the day before the election, which couldn't be a better timing to That's think about these issues in a heavier way. Well, thank you both for uh, joining us today. And thank you to all of the attendees who were here. Um, if you have any further questions, you can always email uh, me at the Art Gallery of Guelph and I can pass them on. So anyway, um, I hope everyone, uh, everything goes well and do vote if you have the opportunity and can. So. All right, take care everyone. <laughs>